the Association of North Lebanon for, for hosting us. And uh, thanks for organizing this great meeting. Uh, the topic of this presentation is how to simplify complex cases. It was the topic of the whole meeting, in fact. Uh, ever since we have started placing implants, incorporating implants in our treatment planning, our objective has always been restoring the case in the best of function and aesthetics. However, when we are faced with situations where we have severe bone loss, uh, oftentimes we have to go to more complex treatment modalities. And for some reason, and one of them being the patient, either demand or necessities, age, resources, medical condition, uh, demand for aesthetic or function, and anxiety. When they come and you propose an advanced surgery, oftentimes they try to refrain and they, they just stop the treatment. So we are often, for this reason or others, uh, uh, elect to, cho to, to choose uh, uh, selective techniques that are a little less invasive, but keeping in mind that at no time what we call simplification shouldn't be considered a compromise. It's not a compromise. We're using a technique that we believe is effective, safe, reliable, but at the same time is not uh, demanding in terms of uh, advanced surgeries and uh, complicated situations. So again, and I insist very much on that, when we talk about simplification, let's, let's make it clear from the start, it is reducing the time needed to complete the treatment. It is reducing the morbidity and the complications in treatment. It is reducing the cost on the patient because any advanced surgery is not always not only complicated, but it really uh, put a task in terms of finances on the patient. But keeping in mind that in all cases, the result should be the same. So if we select an easy technique or what we call a simpler technique, doesn't mean it is always simpler in terms of surgical procedure, as you will see now. It is probably less invasive, it is less costly, but it, is, it remains quite on us sometimes complicated. So from the beginning, we set the tone clear, simplification is not a compromise. It is a situation where we have to do things in the proper way. This patient, I saw him last week, and he came to have this area treated. And this, this dentist who worked this case simplified the treatment already by placing two implants, bypassing the sinus, avoiding to go into sinus stiff procedures, and in this particular area, placed three two millimeters implant, which may sound unusual or apparent to so many people. And this has been in function for 15 years. So where, where do we stand today in terms of placing implants? Is this something that is acceptable? Is this something that is acceptable? When you see this done today, maybe one implant here, with that one would have been enough to place a four or three unit bridge. So why do we have to place three two millimeters implant? to restore the case. This has been functioning. Look at this situation that we treated last year. Patient came with these implants placed, supposedly simplifying the case. The old one, two, three, four, five, six, seven mini implants in the anterior maxilla supporting a fixed restoration. The end of the day when we took a comb beam CT, look where the implants are, completely outside the body envelope. So we simplified the patient, the, the dentist who treated this case, tried to simplify it by reducing the cost, the time of treatment, whatever it is. But in fact, the way the, the case was treated is far beyond anything that is called today acceptable. So we have to repeat everything, of course. So again, when we talk about simplification, we have to really realize that it's not at all a matter of compromising on the results. The case was retreated. This is the end result but using what we call today standards of therapy to reach aesthetic and function. Now, the question that we ask is, can advanced surgeries be, be avoided? 
so I'm going to uh, uh, present four different case scenarios. The one that relates to short implants and narrow implants in limited height or width. The angled implant, can we use angled implant and still have good result at the end in order to avoid sinuses? Do we need to go to the tuberosity to place the implant to avoid the sinus, bypassing this vital structure? The all on four procedure in total edental respiration is a very interesting technique. I will very, very rapidly fly over it. And the implant plays lateral to the nerve. Because we have sometimes situations where we have no bone coronal to the inferior alveolar nerve. So what do we do there? We need to do vertical reconstructions. We need to go to more sophisticated therapies that are, in most cases, maybe 10, 20, 30 percent, and some, some publications talk about 50 percent complications. So what do we need to do that if we can do something that is easier? So simplification here is really getting to the result in a simpler way Putting a task on us, because placing the implant lateral to the nerve is not an easy procedure at all. But yet, serving the patient in a matter of two months, the patient is rehabilitated. So let's start with the short implants in the deficient maxilla first. So this is a situation that we treated in 1991. How did we get involved in that? And we had a great publication that is often quoted in the literature that we did in the IJOMI in 2001 on short implants. But our experience with that started a long time ago. 1991, we didn't do sinus lift in those days. So we have a sinus. We use seven millimeters implant here, screw vent. We didn't even use open implants. Screw vent implants, which all machine surface implants in the sub-sinus area. And this is the situation some 20 years later. So we have learned from this. We have learned from this that it is possible with simple techniques, as we call them simple, to, in terms of reducing the time, the cost, and putting a little bit less on the pressure on the patient in terms of morbidity and pain and post-operative discomfort. And so getting to a result that is really quite acceptable with seven millimeters machine surface implants that we don't even use anymore today. The question is how predictable that is. It's not a matter of place, a seven millimeter implant placed in the maxilla on a bone of a poor density is very difficult and may not succeed. So you need to have at least bone of a good density to try to get venture into these kind of things. And we did over those past 30 years, so many different cases trying to avoid the sinus by using wider, shorter implants, avoiding the sinus and even in that case, staying away from the sinus, because the patient, for some reason, didn't want to go into sophisticated procedures. Look at this. Even here, well, this was a bridge that had to be extracted. This tooth has to go. This tooth has to go, but the patient didn't want to stay without any tooth for the time period of the treatment. So we did the parietal amputation here, kept this tooth in place, did a four-unit bridge here, and then placed the implants where we want them to be, avoiding the sinus. And one time came, we extracted the tooth and then put the bridge on it. So the intermediate period was a smooth period for the patient because he could function properly. This is simplifying the treatment. Of course, it's not getting into more sophisticated treatment. Look at this. This patient came here because he had six or seven millimeters of bone here with the chance to place an implant of a longer dimension. Would you do internal sinus lift? Would you place a short implant? Does it work as effectively? So we did internal sinus lift first in 2005. OK, done. The things work properly. A few years later, the patient lost this canine because of a vertical fracture. And we needed to place a long and a short implant. Would you do the same? As a comparison, we did do the same. We placed a short implant, 7 millimeters by 5 here, and a long implant, 2006. And guess what was the result? This is 2017, 10 years later. Exactly the same result on both sides. So when you have enough support for implant to sustain the load of occlusion, you don't need to go into sophisticated techniques. Oftentimes, these simple procedures are more than enough to give you the good result. Now again, look at this situation. This is for sure today 99% will prescribe 
external sinus lift. Of course. So look what we did. The patient didn't want to do that. So we placed two implants. Where did we place them? One taking anchorage in the septum. You have to locate it properly, and then in the procedure, go right in there, impact the implant, first prepare the site properly, and place those two implants. One of them is seven, and the other one is 8.5. This is the restoration. This is six years post-loading and 11 years post-loading. So we could simplify the case, yes, by using white implant placed in the proper sites. We didn't put it here. We went a little bit further back and anchored it in the septum, which is a very good cortical bone where we can have a good primary anchorage. Again, this is another situation where we have little bone below the sinus. Would you do sinus lift, internal, external, whatever? This is a situation. 11.5 by 3.75 and 7 by 5 implant, 2006, 2016. So we know it works by using these short implants in a bone of a good quality. That is really important. We can expect to have on the long term equal results as if we would have done advanced surgeries. Look at this case. This is an extreme situation. The situation before we started the treatment, have four millimeters of bone here, poor quality, four millimeters, poor quality, indication for external sinus lift, grafting, waiting six months, and then placing the implant, waiting another four to five to six months, and then restoring the case. Look what we did. When we came to place the implant, it was a seven by six, is one series of implants that were provided by Noble Biocare at one point in time, and we did 30 of them. We lost a few. We did not succeed in all cases. Expect to have some cases who do not work, which do not work. So what we did, we placed the implant, forcing the case in. The bone was of a such a poor quality, we underprepared the site and then placed the implant. And when it is there with a good primary stability, we closed the case, and as you know, without really meaning it, we did a little bit of an internal sinus lift. We didn't use any bone graft. On the side, regular dimension. What happens in a case like this? Situation was in 2007. This is 24 months. This is 10 years later. 10 years later, this is a single seven by six freestanding implant with the crown holding on it in the molar area. Again, the question that we ask, is this predictable? Can we do it predictably and really uh, give assurance to the patient this is going to work? Honestly, we cannot, because this situation with an occlusal overload would lead to fracture of the bone at the site. And you can, and the implant can get disintegrated in time. It's not going to happen the first year, it may happen the fourth or fifth year. This is a situation where we lost an implant, the same seven by six. No, 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 this is another situation. Seven by six, we had, again, five to six millimeters of bone height, apical to the sinus. We placed the implant, but we were so concerned about not getting in too much. I think I would have really gone a little bit more here, maybe another more, more, more millimeter more towards the sinus. Then we closed, we waited three to four months. The situation before, the implant in place, and then the crown. And everything seems to be working quite nicely. This is nearly three, three years post-loading. We said we succeeded. In fact, in time, and we have had this kind of experience with any kind of implant. Nobel, ITI, trauma, anything you want that were referred back to us. This is the situation. Four years post-loading, it was functioning perfectly well, except that one day the patient came and said, the implant is shaking. I said, it may be, maybe screw loosening. It's not screw loosening. The implant is lost. Why was it lost? Because of overload. It can take as much as it can take. So with short implants in the maxilla, posterior maxilla, holding, uh, freestanding with the one crown on it, in time, we may expect to have problems. And because of a closer overload, lose the integration around the implant. This tooth had to go. 
because it fractured. So we did external sinus lift and two implant because the patient didn't want to do any more uh, conservative treatment. So we went into a more sophisticated procedure. Now, what is the fate of these short implants? Five to seven millimeters implant. This is one of the reports. And as you can read here, 11 failures out of 110 implants which is maybe too much for you. We cannot afford to have failures of that range of 10%. It's not possible. So initially, in order to be on the safe side, we have to give the proper indication, and this depends not only on the bone height, but on the bone quality. The same thing goes for this publication on short implants, six millimeters with 33 patients, 45 implants. And again, and when would these, ha would these uh, failures occur? In the first three years, practically the same as advanced surgeries. But wait a little longer. Don't expect the result to come the first three years. We have to wait a little longer. And in time, as you would see here in this publication, after the second or third year, and even the fourth year, you can lose an implant. And what is the cause of that is occlusal overload. And worse is when the patient is a bruxer. So again, this is a situation where we need to take advantage of any kind of bone and uh, anatomical advantages to place the implants. We didn't place the implant here. We put it right in the septum because this is the best place to be. This is 10 years follow up on this implant. It's perfect because you have a cortical where we could anchor the implant in. And same thing goes for here. Posteriorly, look where the septum is. So place the implant where you have the good cortical and then you can expect to have a good result on the long run. Again, and same thing for here place the implant where the cortical is. So not only is it a matter of height, it's some anatomical feature that can help you really uh, anchoring properly the implant, maintaining good primary, primary function, and then in time, expect to have good results. Now, in the posterior mandible, we have uh, more reason to play short implant because when the mandible resolves, you have little bone left coronal to the inferior alveolar nerve. So our story started in, uh, wait a minute, I am sorry, in 1990, 90. we placed those two short implants, look at the crown to implant ratio, 1990, we said it will never hold because the crown to implant ratio is far beyond two to three with those seven millimeter machine surface implants, except that the patient disappeared, came back some 20 years later. And because we placed crowns with, with the, uh, acrylic and not ceramic, acrylic needed to be changed. So we changed the acrylic and we took the x-ray and look at the amount of bone loss. Nothing some 20 years later. So if the bone is of a good quality, we can expect to have a good result. The same result, the same kind of situation with the poor of a poorer quality, the bone of a poorer quality, don't expect to have the same results. It may fail, it may fail because of overfunction. And we repeated this over and over on so many situations. This is a single uh, tooth done in 1996, some seven years later. This is another situation, 1995, some 15 years later. So they may function. What is the chance of losing them? Same as in the maxilla. Same as in the maxilla. If you don't have a bone of a good quality and if the patient is a broxer, so you are in a situation of overload, expect to have a failure no matter what kind of implant you have used. No matter what kind of implant you have used. Okay? We have seen them happening in all sorts of situations. This is typically a case. The patient was told that it was not possible to place implants for her, that she has to function with removable appliance. She was really reluctant to go into advanced surgeries. So we decided to use short implants. Well, this is a CT scanners in those days, not cone beam CT. CT scanner, and as you see, little bone is left over coronal to the inferior alveolar nerve. So we place three implants on each side, three on one side, two on the other side. In fact, each implant is, will replace a tooth. Don't try to place bridges, two implants with three on short implants. No, each tooth has to be uh, rehabilitated independently. And then here we go. This is a situation restored, eight by four, six by five, six by five, in, on the right side. On the left side, eight by five, and six by five. 
And this is the result. Some nine years later, there is no bone loss. Practically, a little bit of remodeling here, maybe here. But expect this also to remodel in time. But the rest is functioning perfectly well. So what do we conclude from this? If the bone is of a good quality, and if you replace each two separately with a short implant, if you can control the occlusion function, and if you control the parafunction, occlusal overload, chances of having equal success as in restorative and reconstructive surgeries, it's the same. Same. Same kind of results. Now, look at this. When we talk about short implants, we can also have extra short implants, or so short implants of the six, six millimeters. I wish I can go a little bit further in detail here. But I have the case before. We did a combium CT before treatment, and the combium CT post-treatment. And as you can see, we didn't have much much places to maneuver. Six millimeters sharp, you go seven, you hit the nerve. So you're telling me simplifying. It's not simplifying, you're putting the task on us. It's very difficult to do this. And it's easier for me to reconstruct the one and placing a longer implant. But if I don't do this, if I miss by, end, by one millimeter, I hit the nerve, and then I have a permanent paresthesia, which I don't want at all. Now look at here. Same thing goes for here. Little bone is there. So you have to be very cautious in drilling and not to exceed, not by one millimeter, the dimension of the site. Same thing goes for here. You see that? So we place six implants on this patient, three on each side. And this is the final reconstruction. And here we go. And then again, the results. Do we have results? Talking about short implants uh, or even narrow implants, because sometimes you're forced to place a 3.3 and not uh, 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 four millimeters or 4.3, whatever it is. So the, the, the success rate is excellent, even with narrow implants in the posterior area, provided, again, you have a good distribution and the number of implants needed to restore the case. Okay, 10 years follow-up for these narrow implants, same result, good results. So don't be afraid of using narrow implants if they are supported by implants of regular diameter. Again, what about the four millimeters implant? So we have a little number of them, just because they're not guaranteed. If you fail, $350 go down the drain. They will not be replaced. And they are not covered by the American Dental Association, by, by the mere fact. In the United States, they don't give assurance for that. They're not approved yet. I don't know if they are now. So we placed four millimeters implant for this case that really went into so many different surgical reconstruction that all failed. And finally, it was decided to place four millimeters implant. So here we go. Four millimeters was one that is a little longer. Now, what are the results? Expect to have more failures. Late failures with the four millimeter, 92% success rate. So we simplify, true, but it's not the same result. We have more complication with advanced surgery, it's true. But again, if you want to go <clears throat> by the best that you can offer to the patient, if the patient is willing, I would reconstruct first. Now. This, the, the problem of short implants is not only a matter of resorption from here, but sometimes the inferior avular nerve is really close to the coronal, and it happens, all, it happens in a number of situations. That is 30% of the cases where the inferior avular nerve is coronal to this normal position. So you have a good height of bone, but you don't have a distance here to place the implants, and that's why you go and place short implants. Now, we have poor outcomes. Don't, I'm not pretending that I have 100% success. Wrong. Two to 3% of the, page, the implants I place yearly fail for reasons sometimes I, I know, sometimes.